Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, the European Parliament has voted to suspend membership talks with Turkey. Will this lead Ankara to reform or just drive Turkey to align with Eastern powers? And we speak to Jane Goodall, famous for her research with the Chimpanzee Society, about her life, her work, and why she is still promoting animal rights in her 80s. And we start today's show in Turkey, where European Union lawmakers have called for a temporary halt to membership talks with Turkey. This non-binding vote is seen as a reaction to Ankara's crackdown following July's failed coup. Turkey said an end to the relationship would damage Europe five to six times more. EU leaders are due to discuss Turkey again in December, but for now, is this really the beginning of a breakup? A vote of no. The EU Parliament voted 479 to 37 in favor of a non-binding motion to end Turkey's EU accession process. The aim is to urge the EU Commission and national governments to freeze the negotiations that have been going on for 11 years. Around 40,000 people have been arrested in Turkey and over 130,000 dismissed from public sector jobs in the wake of July's failed coup, a move viewed by the EU as a disregard for democratic values. You began asking what would you do if Turkey opens its gates. Look at me, if you go any further, these border gates will be open. Turkey warned Europe that cutting ties with Turkey would mean a flood of migrants to the bloc. Ankara also said it could instead join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. The country has aspired to be part of the EU since the 1960s. But it was not until 2005 that accession talks actually started. So far, only one of the 35 so-called chapters necessary to complete the negotiations has been closed. Turkey agreed in March to curb the flow of migrants and refugees to Greece. This was in return for several incentives, including EU cash assistance and visa-free travel for Turkish citizens within the Schengen area. Now the EU is relying on Turkey to stand by the deal on the migrant crisis, an agreement which has greatly reduced the number of migrants arriving in Europe. But for the MEPs, the risk of that deal failing didn't stop them voting to end accession talks. For far too long, we have dishonestly dangled the prospect of EU membership in front of Turkey. Continuing the illusion of accession talks, uh, with, uh, uh, with a regime that becomes more and more authoritarian, I think that we are losing credibility to do so. The European Parliament's vote is non-binding. It doesn't automatically mean the talks will be frozen. The bloc is now struggling to reach a common stance that would balance EU nations' need for Ankara's continued help to block hundreds of thousands of refugees with their concerns about rights abuses. And for more on Turkish EU membership, an everlasting topic, I have to say, in Beijing, we have uh, Mr. Bruno Massange, who is a non-resident associate at Carnegie Europe and the former Secretary of State for European Affairs with the Portuguese government. Welcome to our program. He's also former political advisor to the Prime Minister of Portugal. Meanwhile, sitting in the Beijing studio, Mr. Choi Hongzhen, Director of the Department of European Studies at the China Institute of International Studies. Welcome, sir. In Ankara, Turkey, joining us is uh, Mr. Chauchik Cholakulo, who is a professor in the Department of International Relations at Yaldering Beyaz University in Ankara and also the advisor to the Center for Strategic Research of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Turkey. Welcome as well. I hope I pronounced your name right, sir. I did try to exercise a little bit more before I did it. Okay, so first question for you, sir. Professor Cholakulu, the important thing is how should we understand yeah. The timing of the European Parliament's vote about delaying the further consideration of Turkey's membership of the EU. How should we understand the timing? The coup already happened a few months ago. Uh, first of all, this is the first uh, civil crisis since 1999, uh, when Turkey was declared a candidate member to the European Union at the time. Uh, so, uh, as also, this, this is the first crisis after the start of the negotiations, membership negotiations with the European Union uh, since 19, uh, 2005. So, this is the, of course, crisis between Turkey uh, and the European Union, but at the same time, 
Also, there is an ongoing uh, negotiations and also ongoing process and cooperation between two sides. Mm. I think uh, when we look at the long perspectives of the Turkey-EU relations, there are some ups and downs. Uh, so now the relationship is, is in, uh, in uh, severe uh, conditions, but that not means that uh, the European Parliament decision uh, will, will be frozen the uh, negotiation process and also halt the old relationship between Turkey and the EU. So and now uh, the, the, the general mood in Ankara right, right. now, uh, particularly the, the Turkish diplomats and also the broadcasts engaging with the EU uh, process. So yeah, there is a problem, but we can sit and talk and uh, manage the situation uh, soon after the crisis. Mr. Masai is here in Beijing. Well, is it really like two tracks that we are talking about? One is the chaos and you know, discussion and debates, whether EU should accept Turkey. The other is the real negotiations are, can still go on and will proceed anyway. No, the real negotiations are just as bad as the public pronouncements. Are you sure? Yeah, I am sure. Uh, and I've seen some of that when I, when I was in government. They've been uh, deteriorating for five, ten years. And then the coup was uh, the last straw on, on both sides. Mm -hmm. Turkey thinks that the European Union didn't react as it should, and the European Union thinks that the Turkish reaction to the coup has been uh, disproportionate, mm. um, uh, and in fact, be disproportionate. But the question is, uh, how much power, in terms of political power, does the European Parliament have? No, this is uh, this doesn't matter. This is uh, non-binding. Uh, I think it is, uh, in fact, an uh, uh, unhelpful decision. But it could indicate that next month, leaders, when they meet, for the European Council. Could, it's possible, I'll give it a 50% chance that they could take a similar decision. Uh, but of course, to really fr fr freeze the negotiations, you need a unanimous vote by all member states, and that might be difficult to obtain. Right, I want to follow up a little bit, because at this moment, uh, President Erdogan, coming from Turkey, already reacting very emotionally. He's already suggesting if Turkey's membership uh, by the EU is not being considered seriously, he's going to, quote unquote, open the gates, let those, uh, uh, migrants and also refugees come into the European continent. The, Turkey is not going to be there act as a guardian anymore. So, can the EU afford that? Uh, not really. I don't think it's going to happen because it's not in Erdogan's interest. He's getting a lot of money from the EU. Uh, also, if he opened the gates, then he doesn't have that leverage over the EU anymore. Uh, but still, the threat is being made. It could, one day, things could get out of control. Mm. The problem with these things is that uh, you don't intend to, to, to get to a certain outcome, but if you're always playing with it, sometimes you lose control over the process. Mm. Professor Cholakulu, I want to come back to you once again, because after uh, President Uruguay made unquote, threats, uh, Mrs. Angela Merkel from Germany, the, the Chancellor, suggesting threats from any side is not helpful. Now, let's bear in mind that both she and the current European Parliament uh, chairman are going to compete for the position of the Chancellor once the German election begins. So how should we understand the entangling of both national politics and certainly EU's relations with Turkey? Actually, when we look at uh, uh, Turkey-EU relations, it's very complicated and well structured. Uh, so sometimes uh, some politicians uh, put some uh, extreme statement on that. But at the end of the day, we can see that there is a compromise. Uh, we can reach a compromise for that. Uh, if you look at the uh, ref uh, migration deal, so uh, I think there is a need for further and structured uh, cooperation between the EU and Turkey. So uh, th there is no, I can say, chance to stop the deal right now because of the uh, very integrated relationship for that, because the number is very huge. And also, there is a need for burden sharing for that. And also, east side to, to, to increase the cooperation mood mm. rather than uh, escalate the relationship or severe the relationship in, in that manner. So uh, I think. Uh, Depend, depend, independent from uh, f from the political developments in Turkey or in, in Germany and in some other countries in, in the European Union countries, uh, we can see that uh, there will be a compromise for that because right. the refugee in the EU and Turkey was very well structured deal and also that there was a very uh, deep rooted debate uh, in, in the uh, recent months or years. So I don't think that uh, the current crisis in the EU or uh, between 
the EU and Turkey will not harm the uh, refugee deal right now. I, uh, Mr. Tue, we see the Turkish par uh, panelists rather uh, quite want to brush off the negative possibilities. Mm -hmm. Well, our friend coming from Portugal, mm -hmm. who is now working very closely with the European countries, mm -hmm. are suggesting there might be some serious issues in the next few months to go. Yeah. But, Mr. Tsui, the picture is not just between Turkey and the European countries. It could be much bigger. Right. Because we are talking about some new possibility of alignment and new possibilities of cross-Atlantic relations. Uh, Mr. Tsui, I want to throw this bigger strategic question to you. We understand that President-elect Trump has already put out somewhat clues about his future policies. Might be closer relation with Russia, right. which the European countries at this moment do not necessarily enjoy, mm -hmm. and also might be new policies toward the immigrants, right. whether legal or illegal. So how will those winds spill over on the issue of EU's relations with Turkey? Mm -hmm. We see elections also going on on the European continent mm -hmm. over the next year, mm -hmm. almost every point of the year. So what do you think? Yeah, exactly. Yes, it's very interesting uh, imagine, imagination about the uh, future of the situation, especially after uh, the election in the United States. It looks like uh, President-elect Mr. Trump will change everything. <laughs> And I would like to say, according to... Uh, of course, he will not, but yet the indication could be right, an interesting point. Right, right. According to his uh, uh, you know, words during the campaign for the uh, president, I think that uh, now, uh, firstly, we need to uh, look at if there are any potential or possibility for this change of the uh, American and uh, uh, Russia relations, because I think it's a very, very fundamental mm. factor for the situation now in, uh, uh, you know, uh, especially in the relations between Turkey and the European countries. That's right. Another thing, I think that uh, once there is a change of the relation between Russia and the United States, certainly, I think for European Union, it will face a very, very difficult situation. Okay. Because which means that, uh, how about, uh, because bes uh, besides this, um, I mean, uh, migration issue, refugee issue, it's especially also the issue a, of Ukraine. Yeah, it's a difficult uh, mm -hmm. relations with Turkey now. As we know now, since uh, also the uh, domestic coup in Turkey, now Turkey and Russia got closer and closer. Right. So, which means that uh, once there is a good relations between Russia and the United States, certainly there will be maybe a good situation uh, between building, Turkey and the building United Building upon States. some of the possibilities and assumptions, which are very important. Let me go yes. back to you, Mr. Chalakulu. Uh, that is, what about Turkey's specific thoughts at this moment on joining SEO Shanghai Cooperation Organization? As we all understand, that organization, the pillars of it could be Russia, and China and some of the Central Asian countries, not necessarily Turkey, used to be very close with, and yet Turkey applied. And the phenomenon of application itself already indicated something, it seems. Uh, uh, Professor Chalakulu, what do you make of it, that related to you know, the debates and the uh, chaotic discussions going on between Turkey and the European countries? Well, uh, actually, the, the alternative road or axis shift for Turkey from uh, Western uh, country or Western world to the Eastern world. So, this is basically for domestic politics. Uh, many Turkish experts are against this idea uh, because of the very deep rooted relationship and also partnership with Western institutions, including the European Union and NATO. Uh, but on the other, of course, Turkey is eager to, to be a part of uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization member. Uh, because of the, di uh, the, the need or uh, the will of the diversification of Turkish foreign policy in that mm. manner. Uh, today, uh, Pre Prime Minister uh, Binali Yildirim made a statement that uh, he didn't consider the Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, was an alternative to the European Union. So, uh, when, we, when we compare the capacities uh, and also the, the visions uh, and the other matters uh. between the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the, and the European Union, so th there are some differences for that. So it, it is not alternative to others. So right. Turkey, basically, or the, the strategic might in Ankara, 
consider that, uh, of course, uh, Shanghai Cooperation is, Organization is very, very useful uh, tool for Turkey to, to extend relationship with uh, Eurasian countries, uh, Russia, China, Central Asian countries, and plus others. Uh, but on the other, uh, the EU is still economically is very vital for Turkey, for mm. Turkish economy. So uh, the, there is a compatibility rather than uh, the, as an alternative considering for Turkey. I see. So this is the, uh, the main look from Ankara at the end of the day. Uh, Mr. Masaj, uh, if Turkey applies and got into the SEO, is that acceptable to the European countries? as most of the European countries are not necessarily part of the SEO. And secondly, most of the European countries are part of the NATO, which is a very different organization in which some were suggesting its agenda is mainly goes against Russia. Yeah, no, no European country is part of SEO. I think it's incompatible. Uh, it's my opinion that it's incompatible to be a member of the SEO and a member of the European Union and a member of NATO. I don't know if it's legally incompatible, but it's politically incompatible. I think Erdogan is very tempted by this great adventure of rebuilding the world order together with China and Russia. This is his dreams, but then the reality, as our colleague in, uh, in Ankara said, is that economically Turkey is very integrated with the EU. And he has to satisfy this constituency of people that, that so growing middle class so he cannot play games with the economy. So I think he's divided between the romantic dreams. Not even after the coup? Uh, well, after the coup, is more and more tempted to go this way. This is why there's the application. But I think the economy is the problem because Russia cannot offer me anything on the economy, and and China, for the time being, cannot offer me as much as the EU can. Mm. The parliament, uh, the market rather, is in the European continent. Yeah, uh, uh, it's it's the biggest destination for exports right. and especially for foreign investment coming into Turkey. Seventy percent of all foreign investment. Uh, comes Mr. Trey, European. what do you make of those possibilities? And Turkey's overall view, as uh, Mr. Massage earlier suggested, about building a big empire in which, uh, with which the world politics goes around itself. Yeah, exactly. As we know, uh, President Erdogan, indeed, he, he do has a, a dream to become a, a special powerful uh, regional countries. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think it's also natural for Turkey to take use of its uh, very, very uh, critical uh, geographic position. Uh, I mean, uh, in a joint point of, uh, between uh, Asia and Europe. Mm. But uh, I think this uh, kind of uh, efforts from Turkey to be part of SAO at the same time, he also still have the you know, uh, uh, willingness to be part of the European Union and uh, already a member of NATO. I think this uh, kind of uh, uh, imagination, ambition is most welcome. Mm. Why not? Because I think once we have some more connectivity between Asia and Europe, and especially between SAO and EU, because mm. SAO and EU, they are not a rivalry. And especially, and including the NATO and SAO, they are not a you know, confrontation uh, yeah. relations. And so, Turkey is always a very yeah. important gate yeah. for everything. Yeah. yeah. I think if uh, uh, Turkey and uh, President Erdogan has this kind of uh, plan, and I think it, it would be encouraged. Okay. There's one issue that we haven't talked about, that is what do the Turks want? The public. The public at least, Professor Cholakulu, want one thing, that is to have a visa-free travel in European countries, which has been promised to the Turks for a long time and never necessarily implemented 100%. So will this kind of fights at this moment, political one, necessarily they're going to help the public in Turkey to be able to realize this dream or the other way around? Your assessment here, Professor. Well, uh, actually the, the integration to the EU is a uh, basic, basic, basic strategic goal for Turkey and also to Turkish people. people. Uh, and also uh, there are now uh, more than 5 million Turkish citizens living in European countries right now. So uh, as a candidate country and as, as an accession country, as a member of uh, European Union's uh, customs union, uh, Turkish businessmen, Turkish citizens and others, uh, students, also want to be a free circulation, free movement within the European countries, mm. at least the Schengen zone. So that's why it's very important for Turkey. So uh, for decades, uh, being a part of Europe uh, was a strategic goal for Turkey. Uh, now this is still valid one. 
And also, as we underline uh, uh, today's program, so economically, the European Union is still very important for Turkey. More than 40% of Turkey's total mm -hmm. trade with the European countries. So uh, Tur the Turks consider uh, Europe as a safe, uh, stable, uh, and uh, developed uh, continent. And also, right. all uh, Turks want to be a part of it. Uh, without the ideological concern, concern, uh, consideration for that. Uh, right. Even the Turkish Islamists are very in favor of the integration with Europe. Mm. So, yeah. Mr. Masayesh, have to come back to you. So, you made the promise already, the European capitals, you made the promise decades ago. And the Turks want to just be part of it. They just want it to be implemented. They are not asking for any more. Why can't? Why can't we? Why can't the EU? What does that say about EU's credibility for the long run? Yeah, it's it's not good. Uh, when I, when I was in government, I I pushed really hard to move the process forward because I think this has been really affecting the EU. And when I go to Turkey, what I hear is you gave you you signed the document, you gave your word that. Uh, that we are going to move this process forward and that we would be members in time. And of course, the suspicion in Turkey is that you doesn't really want Turkey to be a member of, of the EU, uh, even if they say otherwise. And now the coup has been uh, a watershed because almost everyone in Turkey, I think, uh, thinks that the EU's reaction to the coup was, uh, was the wrong one. Uh, for a few hours, there was no reaction. Uh, giving the impression that some people in the EU actually wanted the coup to be successful. Mm. I think this was a major mistake. I don't understand how the EU leadership made this mistake, but they made it. A lot of confusions, but that is also a lot of co possibilities. Mm. So we'll see where the possibilities are going and where the wind is blowing. Thank you so much, the three of you gentlemen, for being with us. Uh, Bruno Massage mm -hmm. here in Beijing, Sui Hongjian with us as well, and also Mr. Selchik Cholakulu in Ankara for us. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. Thank you. The three of you have a great weekend. My Thank pleasure. You. You're watching World Inside with me, Tianwei, still to come on our program. Initially dismissed as a National Geographic cover girl, Jane Gudo went on to change how humans perceive animal rights. She speaks to us about how she defied her critics. You're watching World Insight coming to you live from Beijing. In a rapidly changing world, only a few could survive ever shorter attention spans and ever more severe public scrutiny. Jane Gudo is one of those rare people. Her stories of being alone in the wild African rainforest, living side by side with chimpanzees, have spread far and wide. They make us, the proud human being, realize the Earth is not and should not be dominated by us, but a home we need to share with all the other creatures. That simple message is more easily understood than implemented. That is why Gudo travels around the world here, even now when in her 80s, to advocate, advocate, and advocate for conservation. Gudo visited us in CCTV earlier, and I had a chat with her. Before she graciously reflected upon the past, she introduced to me a longtime travel companion of hers. The way Gudo presented him reminded me of a little girl with her favorite friend. It helped me better understand the life of a strong-willed woman who has been fighting mainly alone for quite some time. So now, let's meet them. Dr. Gudo, welcome to CCTV News World Insight. Thank you. And you have brought to us I friend. brought, yeah, Mr. H is my traveling companion for 24 years. Oh my We've God. been together to 63 countries, and he represents to me the indomitable human spirit, because <laughs> the man who gave him to me went blind at 21, decided to become a magician, was told that was impossible if you were blind, but he's so good the children don't know he's blind and then he'll say uh, you know I'm blind but things may go wrong for you never give up there's always a way forward does he know that Mr. H has been with you traveling oh, he everywhere does. that's so sweet yeah. 
So that's Should we let Mr. H to rest a little bit? Yes, he can Since rest. he's traveling with a lot of... Yes, uh, he gets very tired. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever that is, whether chimpanzee or human being, they all have their very different personalities. Absolutely. So, what exactly is this special relationship you had with Mr. David Greybeard, the well, chimpanzee? David Greybeard was the chimpanzee who lost his fear of this peculiar white ape, which is what I was. They'd never seen a white <laughs> ape before. And so gradually, because he got used to me, I'd approach a group in the forest, and they were all ready to run as usual. And then they would see David sitting from him to me and back. And I suppose they thought, well, she can't be so dangerous after all. So he really introduced me to his friends out in the forest. David was gentle. Really? He was a born leader, not because he was aggressive in getting to the top, but because he was so quick to reassure that the young ones would want to follow him, just because he was a good chap to be around. Did you try to communicate with him about that community that which you became part of? No, you can't. I never tried to communicate with them. On the other hand, on one occasion when I was following him through the forest, I thought I'd lost him. And then I, I came, I had to crawl through this tangle of vines and stuff. And he was sitting almost as though waiting for me. And so I sat down near him and there was a ripe palm nut on the ground. So I held it towards him and he turned away. He obviously didn't want it. So I put my hand closer and he looked directly into my eyes. He took the nut. He dropped it. He didn't want it, but very gently squeezed my fingers. That's how chimpanzees reassure each other. So in that one moment, we communicated with each other in a language that surely predates human words. Have you ever seen him again once you left? He died before I left. I mean, I was at Gombe from 1960 to 1986. I was at, at, in the forest most of that time. And already David had, he disappeared during an epidemic of, of something like pneumonia. Did you try to save him? I, I didn't know he was sick. You Did you try to look for him? No, because, you know, I, I would only see him maybe once in a week because the chimpanzees wander, they have their, they go looking for food and I wasn't with them all the time and they go around in small groups so males might be alone, two or three males together, a mother with her children, sometimes they all gather up. So I didn't see any of them every day. Are you a member of the community you no. are thinking or you were a researcher whom they took as a member of the community? No. Have you drawn that line always clear or it's actually very blurred? The line between us and them is very blurred. But I never tried to get into their community. I just wanted their trust so that they let me. It was like sitting and almost looking through a window. They trusted me. They knew I wasn't a member of their community. I didn't try and communicate with them. Um, but they didn't mind me wandering about. I wasn't harming them. And so I was able to learn the secrets of their lives. I think I learned about that as a child when I was up in my tree daydreaming up as close to the birds as I could get, out with my dog, watching birds. We had a little wilderness near us. So out in the forest, I didn't really learn much about myself, but I did have opportunity to feel one with nature. And that was just a magical feeling. I think it comes close to Zen meditation. When you have a moment to yourself, when you are visiting Gombe, what would you do? Well, I visit Gombe twice a year and I always go out in the forest and I always insist on one day when I'm out in the forest by my, to renew my spirit. It's, it's spiritual food for me to be out in that forest that I love so much. But what was it like for you as a researcher in the wild in Africa at that time? As I got to know the chimpanzees better, and could sit with them for long hours and then they began to allow me to actually follow them. It was 
it was a, a, the attainment of my childhood dream. It was very hard work. The country at Gombe is very hilly, so there's a lot of climbing steep slopes and quite often losing the chimpanzees. We now have African field staff. They're really, really, really good at climbing up and down the, the steep slopes, but I did my best was very often with chimpanzees all day. And I especially loved following mothers and their families and watching the development of infants and learning that there are good mothers and bad mothers, <laughs> just as there are in human society. What are good mothers and bad mothers acting like? Well, the good mother is protective, but not overprotective. She's affectionate, she's playful. Above all, she's supportive and she will run in to protect her child even though she may get into trouble herself. And that was exactly like my mother. The reason that I was able to do what I did as a young woman back then was because I had this unbelievably supportive mother. She taught me, if you really want to do this crazy thing, going to Africa and living with animals, then you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of opportunity and never give up. And you did and that's what I did. And one of the greatest rewards is the young people who say, you taught me that because you did it, I can do it too. Well, controversies, though, are things pioneers could never escape from. Jane Goodall had her own experience of it from the academic community of her time. She was often described as a National Geographic cover girl rather than a respected anthropologist. Meanwhile, she herself apparently did not have a great passion to be part of the mainstream academy because she discovered a totally different version of relations between humans and chimpanzees. Goodall's passion for animals brought her to Africa, where she soon met with the famed anthropologist Louise Leakey. Although she had no formal scientific education and lacked even a general college degree, Leakey still hired her as a secretary and invited her to participate in a program researching chimpanzees in Tanzania. To make Goodall a more professional researcher, Leakey sent her to Cambridge University, where she obtained a PhD degree in ethology. But there, she found her research technique to be very different from the traditional conventions. At that time, the community generally acknowledged only human beings as having personalities and emotions like joy and sorrow. Whereas for Goodall, similarities between human beings and chimpanzees can be seen in emotion and intelligence, as well as family and social relationships. She gave them names such as Fifi and Davy Greybeard and observed them to have unique and individual personality. That led to a hot debate among scholars and raised questions on her findings. At the time when you were doing the research, there was also debate going on elsewhere in the world when you are bringing out some of the details of your research and observations. People are saying, well, it's not academic enough. Others are saying, well, she probably has different purposes when she went into the wild. There, are also, there were also, you know, she's got just the opportunity that none of us could have access to. Therefore, she's got what she had. I was described as the geographic cover girl. That's how I was described. And I remember that title. Yes, she's, um, she's got there because, you know, she's not bad looking and so her research is useless. It, because she's too anthropomorphic. But you see, fortunately, I never wanted to be a scientist. When I went out to Gombe, I hadn't been to college. I didn't know what was going to happen. I saved up my money. I got to Africa. I had this luck, or whatever, of meeting Louis Leakey. And he's the one who gave me this opportunity to go and be with chimpanzees. So at that time, I didn't have another world. But after about two years, Lewis wrote to me and said, I won't always be around to get money for you. You're going to have to get a degree. We don't have time to mess about with a BA. You're going to have to go straight for a PhD. I've got your place in Cambridge University. 
Um, wow. I, I, to do a PhD in ethology, I didn't even know what ethology was. I'd never <laughs> been to college. So when I got there, I was a bit nervous, as you can probably imagine. And to be told by these professors that I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. They should have had numbers. That would be scientific. I couldn't talk about them having personalities, minds capable of thought, and certainly not emotions, because those were unique to humans. But luckily, as a child, I had a teacher who taught me that for all their learning, these professors were completely wrong. And that teacher was my dog my dog, Rusty. And you can't share your life in a meaningful way with a dog or a cat or a rabbit or a horse, I don't care what it is, and not know that of course animals have personalities. But thank goodness, because chimpanzees are biologically so like us, I was able to break that, break that perception and help people, including science, to realize we are part of and not separated from the rest of the animal kingdom, and we should treat the other animals with a lot more respect and understanding. How did you try to get your point across? Would they listen by, to you? By, I tell you, the only way to get a point across to anybody is to develop a relationship. And I try to get the point across with stories, and I think the only way is to reach the heart. It's no good just arguing brain to brain because there's always an, an, a counter-argument and a counter-argument. So, but if you can be calm and you tell stories and you just talk about things, look, it, it's not your fault. It's not your country's fault. This is what's happening. Mm. What can we do together? But they will to forget it, it. They will forget it very easily. Not if there's a lot of young people helping them to remember it. Shall we focus our attention on one species for campaigns so that people pay attention to this species and the protection of it? Therefore, more attention will be paid to nature conservation. Or we need to spread our attention, our resources, to more species and yet less focused when it comes to campaigns. I think the lucky thing is that different people are passionate different animals. <laughs> and there's enough money out there and enough resources, and especially our young people, our roots and shoots groups, high school, university, mm -hmm. they're actually doing an awful lot yeah. for particular animals. And you know, who are we to say this animal is more important than that? Mm. Fortunately for me, chimpanzees live in the rainforest, like the orangutans and the gibbons. Mm -hmm. And if we protect the rainforest, for the chimpanzee home, we're protecting the home of hundreds and thousands of other species as well. And that's always good. And usually, if you protect the habitat for this particular species, you are helping many other species mm. as well. There are debates. For example, panda, the giant panda, getting a lot of attention, a lot of resources for protection. Not only here, all over the world. Is that the best way? Well, a, I know there's a lot of controversy about pandas, and now people are making money. You know, pandas are exported to zoos who pay huge amounts of money to have them because people go to see them. So, in a way, you can say they're being exploited. And I definitely, definitely think that efforts to conserve the panda in the natural habitat are good. And if one way is to get money from pandas going off to America, and getting hundreds of thousands of dollars to have the panda over there if it's going to be looked after well. And if that's going to help the pandas in the wild, then, then I think it's not a bad thing. I don't mm. think captive pandas are very unhappy if they're kept in the right environment. When you're traveling to the emerging economies and developing countries, that's when they just started up their economic development. People are celebrating what they have achieved materialistically because they've been poor for so long, yep. they've been suffering for so long. But then you bring this idea, and now you seem to have more followers. What has changed? The very first time I came to China, mm. which is about 30 years ago, the timing was so perfect. It was, there'd been, I think it was some great floods, 
And so it was the first time that the government was actually encouraging people to talk. And that's when I happened to come for the first time. I've been able to reach so many young Chinese children through our youth program, Roots right. and Shoots. I remember a little girl standing up in, in her school and she said, I, I found a little bird and it had hurt itself and it was lying on the ground. And I remembered what you said, that we should look after animals. And I took it home and my mother said, I don't want it in the house. And I said to my mother, but, but this little bird wants help. And supposing, she said, supposing somebody found me hurt, want me to be taken into a house and looked mm -hmm. after. So she said, my mother agreed. And we looked after the little bird and it flew away. And I mean, so many young people now, grown ups have said, I first started thinking about the environment when I saw pictures of you in Gombe, you with the chimpanzees, mm -hmm. and I was fascinated, and you taught me about the environment. Thank you so much, Dane, for being with us. Well, thank you for inviting me to your program. Jane Goodall, world-famous animal rights activist, calling on all of us to be with her. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of our program, visit our website. Just type World Inside CCTV News into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. And tune in again next week for more insights from across around the world. Good night and have a great weekend.